So again, uh, welcome everyone. This is session one in room one, uh, which is AI and law. Welcome everyone. So we have, or we would have three speakers in the session, but the first speaker, Maria Bortis, unfortunately won't be able to present, which means like we have a lot of time for the two presenters in the session. And Maximilian, if you are okay with this, uh, you could begin with your presentation. And if so, our, our first speaker in the session, AI and law is Maximilian Kutschmidt from Stockholm University in Sweden. His presentation has the title, European or Universal? The European Declaration of Digital Rights in a Global Context. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very you. much. I'm excited to be at that conference and uh, it's uh, a great uh, thing for me. I will try to share my screen. Uh, please let me know if you can see my PowerPoints. Yes, I can see them. We can see Perfect. them. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for uh, that nice introduction. Uh, yes, I'm Maximilian Kuzmit from St Swedish Law and Informatics Research Institute at Stockholm University. And um, this presentation is part of my research project uh, founded by uh, Maria Skodowska Kiri Action of the EU. And as a disclaimer at the beginning, which I'm obliged to say legally that uh, what I'm going to present are only my own views, and I do not represent European Union uh, in that regard. Uh, so that being said, I want to talk about uh, the European Declaration of Digital Rights, which is a new document from 2022. And uh, during my presentation, I want to ask indeed if it's just European thing, or maybe it can be universal. And uh, in that global context, what it would mean to be universal, what are conditions for universality? And in my presentation, firstly, I will briefly uh, introduce context and relevance, why that topic uh, matters. Uh, secondly, I will talk about the, this declaration as such and about European digital rights, and it will be a legal analysis of what is uh, that document, what, is, uh, what are consequences of it, and then I will move to discussing universality in um, two or uh, three main aspects. So firstly, from philosophical, social and ethical perspective, and then from uh, the legal point of view. And in conclusions, I hope uh, I will be able to answer or at least uh, formulate uh, this question and start the discussion, are we on the path to universal digital rights? So firstly, new technologies and human rights, this is the context of, of that declaration. Uh, we, we see emerging technologies all around and they impact people's life in many ways. Uh, usually this is a good impact. Uh, they empower people to uh, do things they were not able to do before. That's especially visible in context of assistive technologies. Uh, technologies that help people with different uh, difficulties or disabilities to enjoy the life, uh, to be more independent and autonomous. But at the same time, these technologies that empower us, they make us dependent because when we use them, we become dependent on them. The benefits they provide will be lost without these technologies. Therefore, I think that we have here kind of interesting um, interplay between uh, empowering and making us dependent. Many of these new technologies and these problems are kind of like terra incognita and known land. And not only because we are talking about technologies that are new and different, uh, but in many ways, they are of very different type and they raise problems we didn't have in the past. Uh, just to mention uh, issues connected with artificial intelligence and uh, the responsibility uh, for different actions, for different decisions that are made. 
and from as a, as a lawyer uh, by education, I could say that for for lawyers, very very much this question uh, is who's going to pay in case of some failure or some damage, and we don't have simple answers uh, here. We sometimes don't even know how to think about these problems as we face reality that is uh, to be extent uh, diverse from from previous experiences. Uh, that's why innovative technologies raise questions about human rights because also if someone's rights are not respected, were violated, who's responsible, who should be addressed to remove that infringement uh, or who is responsible to uh, guarantee, to protect human rights. Why does the EU matter in that context? Well, uh, there are at least two reasons. The first one comes from uh, the fact that the EU is a big market. Uh, and as, as this one, uh, it's, it's a big uh, innovative economy. And the second reason is that uh, the EU law is a kind of one of the main uh, legal um, regimes currently. The impact of the EU law is especially visible if we think about data protection, uh, general data protection regulation, uh, become kind of a standard or a point of reference for many other legislations, uh, including uh, the US legislation, uh, thinking here especially about California Data Privacy Act, uh, but also data protection laws in other jurisdictions. With that being said, I'm going to move to legal analysis of European digital rights and that will be divided in three parts. Firstly, I will briefly talk about legal status of the declaration, uh, how, how the document should be uh, suited in the whole legal framework. Secondly, I will analyze uh, the matter of the declaration of these rights, uh, mainly the question, uh, is it possible to make any claims based on these rights? And last but not least, enforcement. So to which extent these rights are just uh, maybe some noble, uh, but only declarations or, or they are really rights that could be enforced and protected effect effectively. Uh, the declaration is a document of the European Commission. And in the EU legal framework, uh, the normal path of creating the law is that the European Commission proposes a legal act and then European Parliament and uh, the Council of the European Union together discuss and adopt uh, legislation. However, uh, this declaration is not a um, legislative proposal in a classic sense. And it's acknowledged in the declaration itself in a preamble where it says that this declaration, uh, when, when it's stated that uh, the declaratory nature of the document and it, that it does not affect the content of legal rules or their application. Moreover, it's explained further that uh, the declaration has as a main goal explaining political intentions. So it's kind of a policy document or position statement of the commission and other EU institutions. Because uh, in the, the aim of commission is that this declaration co-signed by other EU institutions, parliament, council, uh, will be some kind of a internal declaration or internal agreement. And here it's important to remember that uh, in the EU, there is a long-standing tradition of inter-institutional agreements, agreements which are not binding uh, external actors, but to big extent, they do bind uh, institutions uh, entering this agreement. Therefore, uh, this declaration should not be underestimated uh, because if accepted by Parliament and the Council, it could be a binding for these institutions and as a result have impact on, uh, on, a, on universal European law. When it comes to 
uh, the matter of the declaration. Uh, there are two factors, the structure and the language. So the declaration consists of preamble and chapters divided into subchapters with statements and commitments. Uh, there are 23 statements and uh, many commitments, which are phrased differently because some of them are phrased in a language of rights, uh, such as everyone has the right or nobody is to be asked to. Uh, that clearly indicates that this is a right, this is a binding statement, normative statement. However, 16 of these statements are phrased more like recommendations using the word should. Uh, that suggests that they are not intended to be binding or uh, be source of claims. However, uh, it's important to, to notice that it could be quite easily amended and changing just one word, should to show, or could, could, could make them uh, binding, binding norms. Uh, therefore, the question is, if these norms or these rights are precise enough to, uh, to build a claim on them. Now, what it means precise, uh, some proposal uh, of, of the, how to understand it is that law is precise if it allows ordinary people to understand their obligations. Uh, then again, of course, we have a question, what it means ordinary person, uh, who should it be? Uh, to not go too, too deep into that, uh, that question of precision here uh, is vital, but it should be examined further uh, with one important remark in mind, that fundamental rights are never uh, precise and detailed rules, or very rarely. They usually have character of principles, uh, quite general, like everyone has a right to life. Well, that could be and is uh, interpreted in, in various ways, because does it mean uh, that the death penalty should be legal? Well, that's the understanding in Europe, for example. But at the same time, well, what does it mean that ever does it mean that everyone has also the right to uh, free and high last level uh, healthcare, which may be important uh, to 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 save uh, someone's life, and uh, this kind of norms are rather rarely found in a fundamental rights law, uh, which has more a character of principles, and this is the same with. Uh, the European Declaration of Digital Rights. These digital rights are phrased more in a general way. Uh, like here we can see examples, everyone should be empowered to benefit from the advantages of artificial intelligence by making their own informed choices in the digital environment. Uh, however, some of these rights, uh, some of these statements uh, are quite precise uh, for example, uh, when they say that everyone has the right to the protection of their personal data online, that right includes the control on how the data are used and with whom they are shared, or the right concerning uh, children, that they have a right to be protected from all crimes. Uh, therefore, there is a very different level of precision uh, in these digital rights. Uh, yet, as I said, because they are intended to be like fundamental rights of a digital decade. Uh, therefore, it's perfectly fine if they are uh, of a, they, they have character of principles. Uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, rights result in obligations. Uh, as, as it was said, that precise law is when someone knows what are their obligations. And uh, the same is with rights, because if one person or one uh, entity has right, others have obligation to respect that right. In that regard, declaration is uh, surprisingly precise because some of these rights come along with the obligations of individuals, organizations, and states. That is something not common in fundamental rights law, human rights law uh, around the world, because usually it is not precise who's responsible for fulfilling or protecting or guaranteeing the rights. Here, in some cases, it is precise uh, that 
if we take into account account uh, the right to, to freedom of expression in the online environment, it is followed by the obligation of online platforms to support free democratic debate and mitigate risks and protect freedom of expression. Now, again, this is my general obligation, yet it is precise that this is obligation not of the state only, but also of large online platforms. When it comes to the enforcement, of the declaration, so to speak, uh, where I can go, what I should do when my digital rights are violated. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It's important to know that rights from the declaration cannot be claimed based on the declaration, because this declaration is binding possibly only for the EU institutions uh, signing it. Therefore, if some member state, uh, let's say Sweden, uh, did something which is against my digital right, I cannot sue Sweden as such or any company in Sweden. However, in some cases, I can do that. And this is because uh, some of these digital rights are protected in other way. So for example, the aforementioned uh, uh, protection of personal data is protected also by general data protection regulation and based on that law, I can make claims. But this is only due to the fact that some of the digital rights are already protected by other binding instruments. When it comes to liability of the EU institutions, uh, this is primarily political liability. So if Parliament uh, signed uh, the declaration and then they do not act according to that, well, as a citizen, I can uh, make them liable with my vote. Uh, now, that may be not enough. So there is a question, is there also a legal liability? Can I sue the parliament or the council or the commission uh, for not um, following the declaration? And the answer is, uh, well, it depends. But as I mentioned, there is this tradition of interinstitutional uh, agreements. And it's acknowledged in the literature and in the case law that these kind of agreements are binding. Therefore, they can be legally enforced. However, uh, till now, uh, there were only cases when one institution sued another for not uh, following the agreement, which is justified by the fact that it is agreement between institutions. Therefore, as a citizen, I am not a party of that agreement. Therefore, I have no standing uh, in that case. Uh, to conclude, uh, digital rights are uh, prepared in a form of declaration, which is more like political one, but some of them can be claimed uh, also due to being protected by other legal acts. Uh, these rights are quite general, have character of principles, as most human rights. Therefore, it should not be a problem to make claims uh, on them due to the lack of precision. Uh, but the enforcement is some kind of a weakness and should be strengthened in the future. Now, the second question connected with digital rights is, are they European only or can they be universal ones? And that leads us to the question of universality, what it means to be universal. I would like to address that issue from three perspectives, philosophical and social, combined together, ethical and legal. When diving into universality from philosophical and social perspective, uh, I'm aware that there is a huge uh, discourse in that uh, regard. So I will just touch some, some aspects of it. The first one of the oldest one is this Aristotelian tradition where universal is considered as something stable and permanent, true in all conditions. When it comes to rights, it's probably not very useful because uh, that universality will allow us to uh, evaluate the logical value of the statements, which can be checked here, uh, as rights are about how it should be not how things are. Uh, the other way to look at universality is to search for some fundamental values 
uh, that are protected by fundamental rights. Uh, the idea behind it is that there are some goods and values accepted by everyone and therefore regardless what are detailed regulations uh, the core of these values cannot be violated and that is guarded by fundamental rights the assumption behind it is that there are some values shared by everyone and if we extend this notion of everyone then we may have problem because if this everyone means my family, my closest family, it's probably easier to find some values that we share and we agree on. Uh, maybe if I ask in my neighborhood or my city, that's also we can find some, some values. The problem starts when it's country or continent or global perspective. Uh, first of all, how to identify these values. And second of all, like if we even agree on some values like human dignity, do we really understand it in the same way? That led me to the social context that many uh, of these values, or at least what we understood under the names we assigned to values uh, are dependent on the context. And that could be economic context and cultural context. When it comes to cultural context, the aforementioned dignity of a person uh, could could result or could be understood differently when it comes to what are conditions uh, that are against dignity of a person. Let's think about prisons. What is the minimum standard that should be provided in the prison uh, or from which point we can call it inhumane treatment? I'm pretty sure that in many countries, even across Europe, we will find significant differences and what is considered acceptable in one country will be uh, understood as something uh, definitely under the acceptable level in the others. Uh, in context of new technologies that could be access to internet but it could be also like uh, the level of uh, services or technologies that a person could afford to, to have and cultural differences excuse me, which are partially connected with, with economic situations. Uh, they are connected with two aspects. Firstly, there are values which are uh, considered as the primal in the society as the fundamental ones. Uh, is what is who is more important in the individual or the society, the group? The second aspect of that cultural differences is, is the role of science and technology in the society. How people accept technologies and science, uh, is it expected to, to use them, to embrace them, uh, or maybe they are treated with some kind of distrust? Uh, what kind of technologies do we accept? Uh, do we accept technologies that identify people and profile them? And do we accept it for the purpose of security only, or maybe also for the just a convenience that I do not have to uh, to memorize a password, but I just scan my face, that I do not have to have my ID card or passport, and I just scan my face. Uh, these questions are also very much cultural dependent. And for that reasons, uh, here it's it's quite hard to find what would be this universal value in practice. So in the interpretation of digital rights. That um, leads us to the question of ethics, ethical aspects of universality. Uh, universal, universality in ethical context could be understood as some universal moral sense, uh, which means that in some cases or very similar cases, we should apply uh, the same rule. However, the question is what institutes or what constitutes the difference? What differences between cases are significant for us and when we consider them to be the same? Uh, in context of new technologies, 
these differences may be in digital, may be in digital infrastructure, in what is available for the people and uh, how it is constructed. But that ultimately leads me to the question or is asked to the question, is there a necessity of uni for universal rights? Do we need these rights to, to uh, organize our society? And that brings me to the legal analysis because maybe uh, this necessity is showed in uh, the law that we need to regulate things and have some rules that will be common in order to avoid some kind of anarchy and chaos. When it comes to legal aspects of universality, uh, in the literature, there are three main conditions mentioned. And usually it's clarity, coherence, and enforceability of the norm. Uh, Clarity means that the norm is understandable for everyone, that everyone can comprehend what is expected from him or her, uh, that can uh, comprehend what are their rights, what they are allowed to do. Uh, the second aspect is coherence. Universal laws should uh, be coherent within the system. If there are some contradictions, some contradictory rules, that system should not be considered universal, cannot be universal because of these differences and because impossibility, <clears throat> excuse me, and because of impossibility to really understand due to these contradictions and to enforce that it could not be universal. And finally, enforceability. If we can uh, make people to obey the, the rules, if we can verify the rules are uh, followed and uh, be sure that they are followed. Uh, in other words, we can establish rules that are clear and coherent with others, but if we cannot really uh, verify if people follow these rules, well, that would not be a universal law. Uh, an example for that from uh, last years, there was uh, in, in some European countries, uh, I, I'm not sure how it was in other parts of the world, but ruled that even in private homes, it was, well, maybe not mandatory, but it was recommended to have face mask during COVID. And, uh, and uh, that was something, of course, not enforceable because it was not possible to check if people follow the rules and uh, force them in some way to, to do that. Uh, however, there is another way of looking for uh, universality. And uh, that's to say that universal law is the one that is legitimate, uh, that is accepted by people. If everyone accepts something as a rule, as a law, then people follow and we do not need enforce, enforcement. Discussion of, of legitimacy uh, is another topic, uh, very long. I want just to mention that uh, in the history, there are uh, four main types of how the legitimacy is, is defined. The first one is that uh, it comes from endorsement of some more fundamental law, more uh, primal law. And in, a, in the past, it, it used to be some divine law uh, given by the god or gods uh, or law of the nature. Uh, but nowadays, uh, we also sometimes consider that law is legitimate if it uh, follows uh, human rights law, or at least is not against human rights. Uh, therefore, that, that approach is still present in the discourse. Uh, the second uh, understanding of legitimacy is that it's a, about proper establishment of the law. So more procedural aspect, that law is legitimate if it's established by competent authority in a proper way. Uh, that's very formal, uh, positivistic way of looking at legitimacy, which asks only about how the law was established. The third approach is to, 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 to check whether, um, whether law uh, 
is coherent with values accepted in society. And this is similar to the previous, uh, <clears throat> sorry, previously discussed uh, approaches to universality in philosophy or in social context. Uh, finally, we can distinguish also approaches that define legitimacy by some conditions. They do not say what legitimacy is, but when we have legitimacy. And from that approaches, I would like to present uh, one uh, proposed by Peter Volgre. And he established or, or distinguished five types of, as he called, rationalities that altogether create some sphere of legitimacy. Uh, the first one is political. So law is legitimate if it serves the purpose that it was supposed to serve. Uh, law should be also legally rational. So follow all rules of the law. That includes a proper establishment of the law, rule of law, uh, non-retroactivity, and so on. Uh, law is legitimate if it accepts cultural aspects, if it does not go against the uh, culture of the country or the society for which it's established. Uh, law is legitimate if it's functional, uh, which means a coherency and uh, lack of contradictions, but also that if it uh, is effective in achieving what it's supposed to achieve. And finally, law should be internally rational, that all these rationalities goes together well, and a law is logically constructed. As I mentioned, these five rationalities are not different types of uh, legitimacy but they are rather uh, some kind of borders of what creates a sphere of rationality. And within that, uh, all legal decisions, all rights will be considered legitimate. The question is, could we find, uh, could we find uh, like a practical, um, uh, precise, uh, could we precise these conditions in a global context? And here we comes back again to cultural aspects, to cultural differences, but also to legal differences as there are different legal traditions around the world, and to functionality, which is connected with technological infrastructure and uh, with resources at uh, dispose of authorities. To conclude, uh, are we on the path to universal digital rights? Firstly, that declaration of digital rights that is that are proposed in the EU uh, is rather a policy statement than the hard law. And it should be read as a policy statement. And it should be understood as some kind of uh, pointing a direction, not the a final result. Definitions of universality I have different contextual aspects, which may be brought to this legal criteria. Uh, however, they are very much at the end also uh, coming back to different contexts, culture, social norms. Uh, for that reason, uh, the future discussion could go in two directions or actually not, to, which are not opposite to each other, but supplementary, complementary. Firstly, normative approach. So to find or argue for some values to be universal, to be indeed common or that should be common for some reasons, but also empirical approach to search for some, some um, middle ground, some, some, some um, understanding of values that would be acceptable uh, globally or if not globally, then in which, uh, uh, to which extent. Uh, and therefore, uh, that future discussion of digital rights uh, should go with these two paths that should be in dialogue with each other. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm uh, looking forward to discuss this topic and to answer any questions that may arise. Thank you very much, Maximilian, for this really well-structured uh, presentation on the European Declaration of Human Rights and the question, uh, digital rights, European Declaration of Digital Rights and the question of in how far they could be uh, universal. So are there any questions? We have five minutes or so left. 
you can either type them in the chat or you could raise your hand and, and talk directly because we are a small group. So, Lucas, you, it's your turn. Just yeah, ask, you. Um, just raise your question. Cheers. Uh, yeah, very good overview. Thank you. Um, I have two questions for you, basically. So first is, um, you've now described uh, sort of the whole thing, but do you think it's a good way of addressing the issue? And if so, why? And if not, why not? It's the first question. Um, second question, enforceability. If, if that is sort of a necessary criterion, could we ever have digital rights? Because as we well, as far as we know, so, you know, at the moment, at least, we can't enforce anything in the World Wide Web. So, you know, how would you get around that? Thank you. Thank you. These are indeed uh, very good questions and, and challenges. Uh, answering the first part, I think it's a good approach to, to go rather with rights that are principles that are quite broad and could be uh, interpreted a bit differently in different parts of the world, uh, because still, if we agree on something, then we have a starting point. <clears throat> and then we can go towards a further convergence. And uh, when accepting these principles, we may be able to find some common ground, some, uh, some essence of these rights, some minimal level of protection. Uh, which is kind of like the idea behind human rights and fundamental rights law. This is that bare minimum. Uh, it's great if we have more, if we have uh, higher standards of protection, but if not, well, at least I know that X, Y, and Z. And uh, that leads us also to the question of enforceability, how to enforce things. And uh, that's totally different area, huge one, uh, but from the legal perspective, we firstly need to have uh, binding norms that could be source of claims and how to enforce them. Uh, where, why, where, well, uh, in Europe, we have European Court of Human Rights, which is quite a good working uh, mechanism as also individuals can sue uh, or can, can go with their applications against governments. Uh, that court is independent on uh, in, in, in its uh, work, so at least in theory, uh, it could give uh, impartial judgments. Uh, that is quite strong, uh, quite strong tool for protection of, of human rights uh, and for enforcement. Uh, now, obviously, the question is, would, be, would, would countries be willing to submit themselves to kind of new uh, set of, of digital rights. Well, that's that's very much a political question, I guess. What could be a uh, kind of a big factor of change here is the rising popularity of ChatGPT, which I believe for many people was a first encounter uh, or aware encounter with artificial intelligence, and that could be some some step towards people wanting uh, their governments to do something in, in that regard. And that's that's probably what what can start, um, what can start uh, change. Great, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I have I have a related question to this. Um, um, you know, I was thinking of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and things seem to be different here because I mean, they they um, may not be enforced they are enforceable to, to a certain degree. And so maybe you explain a little bit what the difference is here from a, from a legal perspective compared to the European Declaration of, of Digital Rights. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, the, the main difference is uh, in the legal status of the document. That's at the beginning. So the declaration is, at least for now, just, just a declaration or like so political statement uh, not a binding rule. Uh, the general data protection regulation is regulation, which is a type of document in the EU that is binding and directly applicable. So all member states have to follow that rules. And if they create their national laws, these laws can go against regulations. So in the US context, it's probably like state law and federal law, this kind of interplay. Uh, Therefore, uh, as a citizen in Europe or 
not only citizens of Europe, everyone whose data is processed by European company have rights under GDPR and based on GDPR can go to the court while with European declaration for now, it is not like that. And uh, also human rights law very often, as I said, because it's just kind of a principles, uh, they are not used to say that uh, as, as a direct claim against uh, some action, but very often against some other laws to say that this law is against uh, the human right or this administrative practice or, or whatsoever. Therefore, it's a higher level law uh, in a, a philosophy of law. The problem here with declaration is it is not reflected in the legal position of the declaration. So to for the declaration to be indeed a source of digital rights at, at the beginning in Europe, it would have to be a binding document uh, of a high level. Thank you very much. See here, you, you, you raised your hand too, isn't it? You have a question too. It's your turn. Can everybody hear me? All right, very nice. Um, thank you. This is a very interesting talk. Uh, I feel very sympathetic to the issue that there maybe should be digital rights uh, just because there is such a thing as digital well being and there is such a thing as digital harm. Um, and uh, uh, and they don't, uh, they exceed the mundane daily proportions too. So it seems that there should be digital rights. Um, but I want to press you uh, a little bit on the point of culture uh, because um, the conception of human rights is still very much embedded in the context of, um, I mean, scholars try to get away from what people have already, what, what Western thinkers have already said about, uh, you know, what rights are and how we should organize society. Um, Particularly, you know, I'm thinking about John Dewey, uh, his communitarian view of democracy. And I literally started reading this book called uh, Democracy of the Dead. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's uh, uh, Roger Ames and David Hall's treatment of uh, maybe there could be some kind of democracy by tradition or by ancestors um, uh, in, a, in Asian society or, or in another society where where it's traditions um, that get votes. Uh, so in these kinds of alternative plausible views of rights and democracy that are, that, that are incompatible with uh, some kind of like individualistic conception of human rights, how much do you think that might be a problem? Because um, I think this kind of view of uh, viewing rights and decency is already represented in society. And I think some people already think the same way about how their online life should be. It shouldn't that, uh, it's not so important to some people that I get certain kind or degree of um, uh, uh, respect uh, in life, but it's more important that my ancestors and my traditions get uh, certain recognition. Yeah, I, I just wanna get your reaction to this kind of thinking. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree that this is a problem that we have, uh, I mean, problem, this is a challenge. This is a challenge that we have different cultures, different sensitivities and different points of reference and how to address it, uh, that's that's a very big challenge um, because indeed, if we agree on some rights as principles, there is a risk we will understand them completely differently. And at the end of the day, then, I still, as individual, I don't know what are my rights, right? And my rights are not protected. Uh, some alternative is, of course, to have uh, like regional systems of, of rights. So uh, then it would be one, let's say, uh, European, American system, other maybe African, Asian or also like well in Asia there are also differences right so maybe like one more like Middle Eastern one like Far Eastern uh, the question is then okay is it global or can we agree on something in a global perspective and here the question that's that's a huge challenge which uh, as I said we can try to address in two ways so firstly to look for some uh, some some values or some rights that we think we we, we are sure that they should be universal and argue for that and then 
in the dialogue, taking arguments from different normative traditions also to see if they can stand that uh, or go with empirical way to find if there is some, some, some uh, even very small, but still uh, a common understanding of some things. And personally, I think it would be great if we can have a globally at least five or six, even like very, like uh, not, not ambitious, but still a common uh, digital rights that uh, I will know that wherever I am, whatever happens to, to my data, whichever websites I access, I have these rights. Uh, that's also, again, going coming back to the question of uh, enforceability, because, well, otherwise, uh, how, how, could I, how could I have my rights redacted? 